Good morning, everybody, and welcome to ABC by CMC, the Animation Business Conference brought to you by the Children's Media Conference. My name's Robert Chandler, and I'm MD and Creative Director of Space Age Films, currently in production on three movies, one live action and two animated. In this first of today's four live sessions, we're going to talk about how animated features are financed and produced by UK and Irish companies. And we have a panel of leading figures in animation and film to tell us all about it. Don't forget, there are also four videos packed with information on various animated topics to add to your insights as ABC delegates. You should have received a link to the private playlist on, on YouTube so you can watch those anytime you want. There will also be uh, recordings of all of today's sessions in case you miss any, and they'll be posted tomorrow on the same YouTube playlist, so you can use the same link to find them. One last piece of housekeeping. You should also have received a link to the CMC Wonder Space, which is set up for virtual networking. Some of you may recall using it in the summer during the main CMC. Wonder is open all day so that delegates can meet and chat, and there are several more formal setups when speakers from sessions or one of the videos will meet uh, delegates to answer questions and follow up some of the conversations here. And finally, just to make it clear about today, we're going to be stopping at 11 a.m. sharp. Those who wish to can observe the national silence with us. Immediately after that, some of our speakers will be in wonder for about 45 minutes, and at the same time, there'll be a chance to meet some of the contributors to the video uh, China-UK collaboration, The Inside Stories, which will also have a room in wonder if you wish to follow things up with them. You need to use the Chrome browser to access wonder, so make sure you download that if you haven't already done that. Lauren is posting the wonder link now. OK, great. Over the next hour, leading industry figures will share their insights and experiences of developing, writing, casting, pitching, fundraising and producing animated movies in the UK. We'll be talking about what promises you have to make and to whom and how much of a film you have to give away in order to get it made. We'll also look at how to avoid developing movies that never get produced, which is easily done, and what it's like to provide service work for the big US studios. So let's meet our speakers. Phil Dobry from Jellyfish Pictures will talk about Jellyfish's experiences as service providers and animated features for studios such as DreamWorks. Andrew Baker from Cantilever will be sharing the story of how Terry Pratchett's The Amazing Morris was brought to the screen. Sean Feeney from GFM Animation will be taking us through his checklist on exactly what you need to have a viable animated feature film. And Britt Gardner of Locksmith Animation will be chatting to us about Locksmith's movie, Ron's Gone Wrong, and telling us how a new studio finds its way to a major launch just a few weeks ago. If anybody watching has questions they'd like to put to our panel today, there is an opportunity to do that in the Q&A, which we'll take at the end of the session. We'll start with Phil from Jellyfish Pictures, who can give us a perspective on the service provider point of view and share his experiences of what it's like to produce animation for studios such as DreamWorks. Let's start with one of uh, a, a showreel of, of, of Jellyfish Pictures.
Beautiful work, Phil. Um, just so we all know, Phil has to leave uh, for an important client meeting at the end of his uh, section, um, one of the great joys of being a service provider. So if there are any questions, uh, do send them through during this, um, this, this next piece and we'll try and answer them within the session. Phil, do you want to just tell us briefly what Jellyfish Pictures is about and how you see your place in the animation landscape? Hi, Robert. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for, for tuning in today. Um, yeah, Jellyfish Pictures started our journey in animation about six, seven years ago. And we actually, when you're working in the service industry in, in terms of animation, I think it's very, very difficult to launch yourself straight into feature work. You have to have, uh, you have to really go through the motions of building a pipeline, building experience and building the, your workflow um, to, to be robust enough to really take on what, you know, the, the, the huge task of building, of, of creating a feature as opposed to, to creating episodic or shorter form animation. It's a very, very different beast. And if you, if you go into it from nothing, you, you, you put yourself at a huge amount of risk if, if you don't really plan it extremely well. And even if you do, it is, it is a tricky thing to do. So we, we certainly didn't go into feature animation from the start. We started doing episodic animation. We've been a, a visual effects company for the best part of 20 years. Yep. So um, animation came to us quite naturally because of the type of visual effects work that we do. And so we, we, we do still have a, a, a strong visual effects presence. And that's a very important part of what we do. Um, Phil, on that, is, 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 sorry, is Jellyfish then segregated into features television yes. work and, and visual effects. Yes, uh, we do far less now. I, I, I think this is the distinction that we're finding. Um, and it's, it's, it's a very it's relatively recent occurrence in, in, in animation service work and in, in animation generally where the market has shifted. What's happened is that, you know, there's the, the quite, let's call it low budget, low margin, episodic, work which you know is quite difficult for a, for a, uh, a region like the uk to do because of our salaries are relatively high here mm -hmm. um so that's a that's a tough tough business to to be in when you're doing episodic animation um and then you had you have the higher end feature the, the 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 industry was quite split like that until quite recently you have the so 200 million dollar movie that the pixar Sony Imageworks, um, DreamWorks may produce, and then you have this lower budget episodic, and there's not, there wasn't much in between. It's it's relatively recent that you've got this sort of new new area of mid budget or lower mid um, feature and higher budget episodic. What's being called feature episodic or event episodic, and that. Some examples of those mid-range that you're, we're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I we just worked on one uh, in terms of feature that Spirit Untamed was a low, lowish budget, very unusual for DreamWorks to make a movie like that. Yep. Um, and it's universal. Actually, you have the the the, the say so on on what what's produced. So that that was a, a relatively low budget feature. Um, Hello, Phil. Let's be on the panel today talking about, you know, lower budget features as well. Um, and there's, there's a real, seems to be a real appetite, a much bigger appetite for those now because of the SVODs, because of yeah. the market. So then not necessarily theatrical release. What was unusual with Spirit Untamed is a DreamWorks movie, and it was, it did have a theatrical release yes. for, for a film of that budget. Um, so, so just so we get a feeling for what Jellyfish does, how much of what people go and see in Spirit is, is Jellyfish's work? Do you do all of it or, or are you the parceled out sequences? On, on that one, DreamWorks are very, you know, with good, with good um, reason, guarded about their, their creative um, and design, you know, stories. So they don't readily let you in there. So they... They very much did, you know, 
hold the story, the script, the storyboarding, the animatic, all at the front end is very much in their in their domain. They have to partner with us hugely because we have to be on board because we do all the asset, we we do some of help with some of the look development, the, the design, but yes. they do have they're very protective of the of the look and the final story. Um, so that you know, from that point of view, that gig for us was quite a sort of you know a clear service gig. But what the wonderful thing about working with a company like DreamWorks, who've been producing huge numbers of animated features at a very high level for many years, 25, 30 years, yep. is that you really learn the process of making animated movies, and you really, it is, it is, uh, uh, it's a really invaluable thing to have gone through we you know we we made a, a quite high level animated special for them that had a train your dragon special before so we got an introduction yep. before getting into feature but i think you know you do learn processes and you do learn that it is a very different business to doing a a either a holiday special or a, a episodic kind of um animated project it's a it's a much more you, you're you need a lot more support you need a lot more people in the places that, that, to be able to report on every single part of it because you're trying to hit you know very clear sort of budget lines and and deliver on very clear milestones uh with a lot of executive input at, at you know at the universal and dreamworks end that that, that you know needs to have to see things at certain times and in That's certain true. ways. And, and in order to respond to that, and I'm assuming other clients have different needs, how do you shape the studio or the infrastructure of Jellyfish? Do you keep it flexible enough in order to respond to each film as it comes in? Or is there quite a rigid, hardcore team that, that keeps that experience within the company? Yeah, there's always a, a pretty hardcore team. That's that's essential sort of part of, of what makes your... your um, USP or your the, the core of your your pipeline and workflow. I think what I think people don't always realize or understand from the outside is is the level of technical pipeline team that you need in place and the, the level of the numbers of people you need in that department to create the efficiencies you need to make an animated movie. You need a lot of um, tools constantly being developed and made in order to make your process more efficient because you can very quickly have to deal with a very high volume number of shots you know at, at the last minute or, or very close to the last minute so you have to be prepared to be able to scale very quickly up and down in lots of different departments so it, it feels to me that in a way one of the things they're buying is security security in knowing that, that jellyfish is going to deliver um, I, I think that that feels quite important. Yeah, yeah I think this is, yeah, I think it's not, you know, there's not many studios around the world that are capable of, de uh, of delivering an animated feature at a, a sort of near theatrical quality. It, it's, a, it's not for a reason, it's not, there's high barriers to entry. Uh, Can you tell us something? I'm going to. I'm just going to interject if you don't mind, Phil, just to get some of these questions in. Uh, just in terms of you talked about around the world, how much of a global presence does Jellyfish have, and how important is that global presence, both in terms of being seen and also in terms of recruitment? Um, well, it's very important in terms of being seen. I think you know it's just, it's it's still a relatively small industry, the animated. You know, and 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 it's amazing how very quickly people get to the people who need to get know you get to know you very quickly when you're doing so when you when you've created a, a you work for say dreamworks you know that very soon all the rest of the sort of players in hollywood will get to know about you very quickly yes. uh, and they know much more than than you think they know <laughs> they <laughs> you know it's really quite scary what what because it, it people just do talk and they will find out so i think once you've kind of broken in, it happens quite quickly that that being known. So that that is 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 great. It's good. Um, it means that that you know if things go well, your reputation is enhanced and and the opportunities come. So that's that's all good. And, and maintaining uh, a reputation can be quite a task and, and and needs a lot of work actually. Can you talk about some of the challenges you're, you're seeing to it, it, recruitment and being able to continue to deliver the quality of service that you're known for? 
Um, it is, it's right now, it is a challenge. Uh, it's a good problem to have in some ways, but I think there's a restlessness generally everywhere. There's a sort of existential thing going on, whatever industry you're in, and you couple that with the fact there's a huge tidal wave demand for content. You yeah. put those two things together, and it is a challenging environment to recruit and retain people at the best of times. So, you know, that, that's, 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 I think we build, there's two things that are essential to our studio. One is our technical capability and our ways of working globally that, that are well, we think are, are well ahead of, certainly were pre-pandemic, well ahead of any other, the competition really. We have a, a very advanced technical infrastructure, which means that we have no compute, no storage on our premises. It's all in a, in a secure tier one data center. Okay. Which means it's like a private cloud. That yep. meant that when the pandemic hit, we were on our first animated feature for DreamWorks. We were able to get people home and working right at the beginning of that very efficiently. So I think that's very important in terms of recruitment, that you're able to, to go to where the talent is and onboard them very quickly. The second thing is, is do you need a really strong, inclusive culture that looks after people, cares about people and shows and, and, and is authentic about that? And we work very, very hard on that. Um, it's difficult to do when everything's remote. Um, today, you know, in our studio here, we, we have got a lot of people coming in. I think culturally, that's very important to, to, to maintain as much as you can a sense of studio and a sense of togetherness, sense of teams. You don't, as you grow, you don't, I think you have to keep teams small and together and motivated and all very much with, with common goals. So they, they're, everyone's aiming for the same thing um, and a sense of their achieving and succeeding. Um, you don't want to set people up to fail. So, you know, you, you, you manage the targets and, and you also, you know, celebrate the good things and the good moments. Those are all really important things that are easier to do when you're all in the studio together. Things you have to double down and work that much harder when you're not. So I think those things for recruitment are important and the reputation then that, that, that comes off the back of that. That, that that sounds excellent. Um, Phil, we're going to have to wind up a little bit just because of the, the, the length of, of today. Is there anything you just want to touch on very quickly about working globally and, and, and sort of playing the, with the money aspects and then tax credits yeah. and, and then just having a, a sort of, yeah, a, a global... It's a, big, it's, a big, it's a big challenge, I think, for everyone, whether you're the producer or whether you're the service provider. It's the same, the same issue because the way the world has changed, that global working... Um, way that we all have now and we're going to have to have when we're making animated movies so somehow you know we're going to have to to i think that governments are always behind you know and particularly tax credit tax sort of zones there are they're, they're difficult to wrestle with um and you know you have to have a certain number of employees in that region you know particularly in the uk to benefit from the the, tax, the less people we have here, the less tax we get. So we have to go, if we've yep. got a lot of people in Europe, um, because of now of, of Brexit, you know, you have to then set up co-production deals and get the, the your, your clients on board with that, whether it's Netflix, DreamWorks, whoever, you have to say, okay, we're going to have to set up a co-production on this. If you really want to take advantage of a tax credit, say in Europe or in Canada, because we've got 40 people working in Canada, we've got 100 people working in Europe, we've got to work out of Spain, we've got to work out of Canada, it's going to have to set up a co-production between those, those different regions to then claim three different pockets of tax credit effectively, because if you're promising them a UK tax credit, um, and yet 50% of your staff are not in the UK, you're not going to benefit enough from that. So it's a, it's a headache, but it's, it's, absolutely doable yeah, um, it's, it's part of how we have to think isn't it and how we have to set things up and, and work phil uh, thank you so much for that i'm gonna have to draw a line under that now uh and and thank thanks. you and, and and wish you well on your service uh you know client meeting i hope that all is good no problem <laughs> and and uh we'll see you again soon thanks 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 phil um Let's go to Andrew Baker and uh, hear about his experience on the uh, the amazing Morris, an adaptation of a Terry Pratchett novel. And I do need to declare that I'm also one of the producers working alongside <laughs> Andrew 
on this project. Um, I, I, it's only fair to say that out loud. So um, I'm not saying it's brilliant, though. I will let you. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's looking. It's, it is looking amazing. Uh, it's living up to its name. So thank you, uh, Andrew. Over to you. Uh, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, so. Uh, my name is Andrew Baker. As, as Robert just said, I run a UK production company called Cantilever Media, and we are currently um, uh, three quarters, in fact, maybe even slightly more, uh, through production on our first animated family feature film, uh, which, as Robert has said, is The Amazing Morris. And um, part of what I wanted to talk about today was uh, the journey that, that I've been on as a, a small UK independent company making our first animated feature, and just run through a little bit of the um, how we did it, you know, what the timeline was, uh, the kind of challenges that we faced. Um, and to start with, I wanted to do a little bit of a, a video introduction and just to set the context here. Um, we started trying to close our finance and lock production uh, during lockdown. Uh, COVID was, was kind of rampant at the time. And we somehow managed to, to kind of pull it all together, make it work, and, and we, we started when we needed to. But um, a friend of mine who, who actually uh, uh, runs the studio in the UK, Red Star, that uh, we were working with, uh, sent me this video, which um, I just felt summed up life absolutely perfectly. And so if any of you are thinking about a career as a animation film producer, or even just an animation producer, quite frankly, um, if you substitute the word theatre for film, uh, this video suddenly makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, so, Darren, if we could run the video, please. This time, the boots are coming off. What have I done, Mr Penny, when the theatres have all been closed down by the plague? Oh, that. By order of the Master of the Revels? Mr Pennyman, allow me to explain about the theatre business. <laughs> The natural condition is one of insurmountable obstacles on the road to imminent disaster. So what do we do? Nothing. Strangely enough, it all turns out well. How? I don't know. It's a mystery. Shall I kill him, Mr. Freniman? The theatres are reopened by order of the Master of the Revels. The theatres are reopened. Mr. Freniman, Mr. Tilney has reopened the playhouses. If you wouldn't mind. Where's the play? Oh, it's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Uh, as you can see, the life of a producer is a fun one. And sometimes things happen that you have to deal with. <laughs> and certainly the uh, the people providing you with all the money uh, can get a little bit nervous. Um, so we are uh, producing The Amazing Morris, and uh, this is, uh, as you will have guessed, a Terry Pratchett adaptation. Uh, we are producing this between the UK and Germany, and this is not a, um, a, you know, a $300 million budget. This is a UK independent feature budget uh, for animation. And so for us, this is a good budget. Uh, uh, we, you know, we felt that we could deliver something really high quality with this. But equally, this is not a, uh, a budget that goes anywhere near some of the big studio budgets. And, uh, and in fact, what we've managed to create with the money we have, uh, we actually think is, uh, is not indicative of the budget. It certainly looks better than the money we spent. Um, but that's, I think, a testament to the skill and the dedication of the teams that we're working with. Um, and so uh, I'm very happy to say that, you know, our budget is around the 10 million pounds mark, which uh, given a, a DreamWorks feature might be 100 million or 300 million, um, you get a sense of the difference in scale and therefore the amount of time and um, uh, animated time that, that, that we can actually put in this. Um, so, however, Andrew, Andrew yes. can I just ask then, how does an independent producer raise 10 million pounds? Ah, well, indeed. Well, um, uh, we, we actually have a slide later on just talking about how this, the structure came together. Um, yeah. but, but absolutely, the answer is not easily. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so if we just go to the next slide, Darren. Um, this is, uh, so this is The Amazing Morris. Um, and as you can see, uh, first of all, we have Sky Cinema. Uh, so Sky Cinema is our UK partner for The Amazing Morris. Um, and second of all, you will notice that we have Hugh Laurie uh, as, as our title character. And both of those are really important things to mention because 
um, to allow us to be able to get this feature off the ground, um, uh, there are some things that just immediately appeal to the people who are going to give you the money. And the first thing is that this is based on the book by Terry Pratchett. So there's an immediate name recognition. There's an audience. They know that the story is therefore going to be interesting um, and that perhaps there's some awareness in the, in the marketplace already. Um, and the second thing is that we have some high profile cast. And um, when you are talking to financiers and you're trying to sell a film, being able to say that you have cast um, of a particular level does make a big difference. Um, our problem on this film was that we had uh, lots of great uh, ideas of who we would like to cast, but actually we were not able to cast them until we closed the finance because we weren't able to confirm dates. And uh, if you look at the quality of the animation, this is the, the first still that we released from the film. Um, you can see just the absolute amazing textures that we've got, the character design, the lighting. Um, this, this really is a, a, a lovely high quality film. But at the point we were raising the finance, we obviously couldn't show that. We, we, we had to uh, uh, essentially say that we were going to do this and, and people had to take us to a certain extent on trust that we were able to deliver this, um, albeit we had designs and we had a teaser and we, we, you know, we had a great production team. But um, ultimately, what we've come up with, um, we feel works really, really well for the story. Um, and as I said, it's, it's definitely not what you would expect for the budget that we have. Uh, so if we just go to the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about the timeline of this because uh, most people don't hear about an animated movie until it's ready to be released. And so, um, uh, for, for example, uh, uh, you'll hear it uh, uh, saying it's going to come out soon. You'll see the posters. People will be talking about it. People will be reviewing it. But you won't know how long it's taken to actually get to screen in the first place. And as with all projects, this, this can take a very long period of time um, or, or, or slightly less. But, but it certainly doesn't happen overnight. And so for us, for The Amazing Morris, the option was in, in 2015. And, you know, it took a little while for the screenplay to come through. Um, uh, 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 the original producer on this was actually a German producer, uh, Ulysses Films. And they uh, approached us and we ended up agreeing a co-pro deal uh, several years after the, the option was signed. Uh, we then worked together on the designs. Uh, we then pitched it to Sky. We then created a teaser. We then went back to Sky and repitched it. We eventually managed to close the finance. And then we've been uh, producing it and we don't deliver until April next year. And for, for the audience, the film will appear as if by magic um, uh, at the end of next year. Uh, and that belies the fact that it's actually taken you know, a considerable period of time to be able to do this. And although some of those dates look like they're quite far spaced apart, um, uh, Robert will testify, we were busy. I mean, we, we weren't doing nothing during the, the kind of the periods uh, and the gaps between those dates. We were absolutely busy doing things. Um, and so it does take a huge amount of effort and organization to be able to get to the point where you can finance a feature film. I mean, I've, I've seen finance plans that are as beautiful as, 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 as the screenplays or, or the concept <laughs> designs. You know, they're a work of art in themselves. They absolutely are. Um, so uh, next slide, please. And uh, so because we are in a position where this is a co-production, I thought it'd be useful just to give you some headlines about how that relationship actually works in practice. And so, um, as you can see, for development, uh, our German co-producer, Ulysses, uh, had originally optioned the book. Um, they commissioned the screenplay because the writer was already on board uh, right at the beginning. And uh, we came on board and started looking at the character designs. And then we put the, the, the deal together to be able to get the teaser made. And then together, we both put together the finance plan, we put, um, which has got money from, from, from lots of different sources, which you'll see on the next slide. And we then put together a pitch pack of all the key information about the film, uh, designs and story, who, who was involved, um, you know, all the different kind of elements. Uh, and then of course, we put together the budget and the schedule. And then when we greenlit the film, it was on the basis of a work split between the different countries. And so in Germany, we had the director and the co-director, we had storyboard, um, uh, and we had some senior production uh, kind of design talent there as well. 
um, we had some of the animation and then we had the compositing and, and, and the FX. Whereas in the UK, we came on board and did all the modeling and rigging. Uh, we had did the uh, uh, about half the animation, uh, including having the animation director here in the UK. Uh, we did all the voice cast um, because the film is primarily an English language film. And so we were able to um, uh, secure all the voice cast and do the voice recordings. And then our co-producer will do a German language version themselves uh, once we've actually delivered the film. Um, and also as part of the mix, we have a UK composer, uh, Tom Howe, who is uh, composing all of our music for the film. And then we're doing all of the post-production uh, in, in London here in the UK. Um, so the finance structure ref is, uh, is partly the driver for that work split. And so um, we started off, the German producer had uh, lots and lots of different funds within Germany that they could access. Um, and so that brought a substantial amount of money to the table, but it was conditional on certain things. So one of those was a particular level of spend um, uh, and certain roles. Um, we then had a pre-sale for Germany itself, uh, which was to uh, Telepool. Uh, the German producer then uh, had to put in investment um, and indeed the German studio put in investment. And in the UK, we mirrored that. So we had our UK film tax credit. We had our sale to Sky, which is the, the, the UK and Irish territory pre-sale. Um, we then, as a producer, had to put in investment ourselves. Um, our studio put in investment. And then we still had a gap. Uh, we still had a position where we hadn't raised enough money, um, despite the fact we had a sales agent with a, a minimum guarantee for the rest of the world. We, we still had quite a sizable gap. And so um, one of the things that I had to do was to go out and find the money to basically plug that gap. And so that ended up being a, a mix of equity, private investors, um, and then uh, debt, uh, where essentially we borrowed money against the sales forecast that we have. Um, and uh, we, we, once we deliver, uh, we obviously are hoping the film will sell incredibly well, and we will pay back all of the, uh, the investors and all of the, the debt. And then eventually, if we are very lucky, um, we might break even and make some money from the sales of the film. Um, and, um, uh, and, and that really is, is kind of how the financing works. Um, the big thing that um, I guess is important for this is that the co this, this production would never have happened if it wasn't a co-production. Um, that £10 million is a lot of money to raise. And so um, roughly, uh, we managed to raise about 55% in the UK and about 45% from Germany. Um, and that includes a split of the, uh, the international sales advances. Um, and so the heart of this film is really a co-production. It's the fact that we have two companies coming together to create the one project. Um, and for that, the most important first thing is that shared creative vision, that actually we all want to make the same film. Um, we need to make sure the financing structure works, that actually we're being clever about this. Um, you know, what percentage of money is spent in which territory to unlock which bit of money? And would it make more sense to move something to another territory to, to maximize that value? Um, part of that is also the legal structure. So um, uh, for us, this was an official co-production under the European Convention. Um, and so that allows the UK to co-produce with other European countries. And despite Brexit, that, that still is in full effect. We are an official European production. Um, and so the German producer still qualifies for all of their media finance and all of their local subsidies. Um, and then the most complicated part of this really was the production pipeline, was making sure that two studios who had never worked together, who had always done things their own ways, um, came together and agreed how we would actually make this film. Um, and so that was one of the things that we spent quite a lot of time on. There was a lot of uh, uh, many, many Zoom calls, obviously. Um, uh, and ultimately, that's what's allowed us to make the film in a very efficient way. Um, and then the next point is repeated three times because it is really the most important thing you can say, which is you have to be in constant communication. Um, these days, with everyone working remotely, you have to do that anyway. But on a co-production where you're in different countries, different time zones, um, communication is absolutely essential. Um, if you don't have that shared vision and that shared um, understanding of what this is going to all be about, 
and you don't regularly keep in touch, talk about things, make decisions together, uh, compromise, which should have been the other C uh, at the end of this, um, then, then you never get anything made. And so um, for some producers, that's the most difficult thing of the entire process because it means that you are not in sole charge of the editorial. You have to work with another company who has the equal say to you, as well as your sales agents and broadcasters and everybody else who's on board. Um, but ultimately, if you can master these, then you can access the finance from another territory and you, you can be in a position where instead of having to raise 10 million for your movie, you're only having to raise five. And that is a significant factor in being able to get a project greenlit. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Andrew. And in the spirit of communication, I'm going to say thank you. Uh, and, and we are going to move on. Just to uh, keep your questions coming in, by the way, thank you, um, amongst others, Mo and, and Claire. If we don't get time to answer them today, I'll make sure they're fed through to the, the speakers who will then try and find, uh, excuse me, try and find time to respond to you. Thanks. Thanks again, Andrew. Fascinating. Um, Sean from GFM, Sean Feeney, sorry, from GFM Animation has a foolproof checklist that he applies to any project before starting the perilous adventure of making a movie. It's easy to waste time developing films that have no chance of ever being made. But how do you tell? Especially when filmmakers tend to get a bit passionate about their projects and they're really keen to get them made. Sean, over to you, please. How do you make an independent animated film? Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, I, I thought I'd do a very 30-second uh, overview of GFMA, as I think we're relatively unknown uh, in the UK. Um, we, are, we actually, at the moment, have six animated features in production and uh, six low-budget genre live-action films in production. So we've actually got 12 films uh, in production. All of our animated films are for uh, theatrical release, or whatever theatrical means in the modern world. Um, that's changing rapidly. Um, so GFM Animation, we're a producer, we're a co-producer, we're an executive producer, uh, we help bring finance to projects, and we were originally a worldwide sales agent. So we've sort of got all of those uh, executive roles in one place. We have no studio, we have no animators, um, there are nine of us sitting in an office. So. We're, we're, we're not a studio like Phil. Um, we're a much larger producer so far than, than, than Andrew. Uh, but I totally support everything that Andrew says. I mean, I think one of the points, clear points he made, which I support entirely, is development takes two to six years, and then making a film takes two years. So you're anywhere, if you're really quick, you're four years. And if you're probably industry average, you're going to be eight years. Yep. So it's not in my checklist, but be patient. <laughs> um, um, Andrew said communicate, I'd say patience is probably um, uh, more important, actually. Um, and then a very, very quick overview, you, you can see some slides. We can't show any footage from any of our current films um, because uh, they're all quite large productions. So until the film is actually released or there's a trailer that's been released, we can't show footage of any of our films. So I apologize for that, we've got some stills. Um, the six, the six animated features, all circa 85 minutes working on at the moment, are uh, the first one is Blazing Samurai, which is going with Cinecite in Montreal. And there's an image. There's Hank from uh, Blazing Samurai. Again, as I, I think Andrew said, you know, this has a stellar cast. Samuel Jackson, Michael Sarah, Rick, Ricky Gervais, and obviously uh, it's based on a, it, it hints at a very famous film probably made 30 years ago. Uh, the second movie we're working on at the moment with Atelier in uh, Montreal is a film called Ten Lives. And you saw a big grey cat earlier in these slides. That's Beckett from the uh, from our cat film, not wishing to tread on Robert's feet. Um, we're, yeah. working on, <laughs> we're working on a movie called Sneaks, which is currently in story reel at House of Cool in Toronto, which is a film about sneakers, believe it or not. Um, we're working... Um, on a 2D animated film called Greyhound of a Girl, which is a, uh, a, an Irish story. And interestingly, I know we have Irish people here. We're doing that with PTD in Luxembourg and Jam Media. And with Jam, we're working both in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. So we're getting the local support and tax credits from both territories, which is a good trick to remember if you're thinking of going in that direction. Um, 
I'm working on a film called uh, Humbugged, which has just started uh, in, in the beat board, and that's going through Luxembourg. So that's again a co-production. Working Sean, on a film. Sean, can I jump in here a bit because yeah. I, all, all of this stuff is, is is brilliant to hear, but but I, I quite like us to focus a bit on 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 yeah. on these films that you're 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 name checking. But but how did you decide on on taking these films? What makes you reject a film? Why don't we start that way, or and and then look at what makes you take on a film? Um, well, I, I prefer to do the take on actually because the take on defines the um, the not taking on. Okay. Um, uh, all right. So we have this bunch of films. How do we decide which ones to follow up on? Because I think, as everyone knows, there are thousands of scripts out there. There are thousands of directors. There's a melee of stuff. Yeah. Heard about the explosion in content. First thing we do in our little checklist. This is a like a summary of it. First thing we do is we look at the the, the lead team. Um, and this is the director, the producer, and the writer. Mm -hmm. So what we do is, uh, say a producer, it's normally a producer-style person who would approach us, and they say, we have, this, we have this idea, we've got this concept. And then the first thing I would say is, who's, who, 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 where's the script? And if you do go to Netflix or any of these you know, platforms, Sky, for example, they will ask to see your script. And your script has to be funny, and therefore your script has to be written by someone there's experience of the, the children's world. You can't take a live action script writer and just dump him or her into animation. You can't take a, somebody to say big visual, visual effects movies, put mm -hmm. them into animation. It's a very specific task. So the first thing is what's the writer done? What has he or she done? What's their body of work? Or is, if there's no body of work, like, mm. um, then you need to read the script. You need to be able to read the script in two hours, in ideally 90 minutes. If it, if it, unless you're a very slow reader, that is. Um, if you can't read it in 90 minutes, there's a little big alarm bell there yeah. Um, yeah. for me. Uh, it's got to flow and it's got to be funny. Mm -hmm. um, kids want funny. Um, you know, a kid's film is not about complicated story arcs, backstories, explosive character development. Kids, kids can't, don't want to follow that, it's too complicated. So they need nice, simple stories based around a core number of characters and they need to be able to follow that uh, act by act, sequence by sequence. So that's for very different from um, films for older people. So then we want to know, we want to know the producer's background. And the reason we want to know the producer's background is we want to know there's a realistic chance this person can put all the complicated things that Andrew described together because it's extraordinarily complex and requires a lot of determination. Um, so those, those, two, those two key elements, scripts and a producer, and my, my big question is always, do these people have the determination to mm -hmm. follow this through? Um, director, which is, which is in our top, top list, does sometimes come later. Directors oftentimes actually come later. But again, with a director, if the director's only directed live action or visual effects, can this director direct animation? Because they're very, very different. I mean, Phil would talk better, better to this than me, but it's an iteration process. So you have a script and a script and a script and a script and a script. And then you have storyboard, storyboard, storyboard. Then you have story reel, story reel, story reel. Then you have, you have whatever you call it, layout, blocking, staging. And then you have iterations through animation and iterations through lighting. You have iterations through the voices. So it's a very iterative process. So it's the reverse of live action. And sometimes, or oftentimes, we come across people who uh, have done visual effects. So they want to make the film look too realistic yeah, they're, they're too focused on the hair or or the cloth, which are really. I mean, yes, it's great to have, but it's not. The kids want to see a core story. So we've got director, producer, uh, writer. If we get through that, we go on to the. That's the first checklist. We then go on to the the the, the second point, um, which is not necessarily in order. Cast. Yeah. Um, we've discussed cast already. Um, the higher your budget goes, the more important the cast becomes. So if you're making a film for, I don't know, very low budget, um, you know, straight to, um, straight to platform stuff, cast is not so important. If you want your film to go onto one of the big platforms uh, or go theatrical, cast is really, really important. Um, now, oftentimes you can't have cast till you've financially closed your film. Yeah. But you can, yeah. you can have a cast wish, wish list, sorry. And that describes helps describe where, where your mindset is. And when you see that cast wish list, you look against the director and the producer and you go, does that fit? Does the cast fit the film? 
or have they just gone onto IMDb and and you know typed in the first? <laughs> so, how um, realistic would you expect that wish list to be, Sean? Um, it's got to be a realistic reflection of the film and what we're going to come to in a minute, which is the budget. Yeah, that comes back to the first point. Does the does the producer know what he or she is doing? Yeah, see what I mean? This is a huge yeah. balancing act. Um, and then also um, comparable films. So we would want the producer and the director to say what other comparable films have been made in say the last five years, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because again that's showing uh, how realistic they are. Because if if as someone did recently, they showed me a load of clips from Brave, it's like well bye bye. Um, <laughs> you know, with your 12 million euro budget, you're not going to make Brave. Um, but there are lots of films where hair and fur, as with Morris, that have been designed very cleverly, yeah. thoughtfully. Yeah. And that's all we're looking for. We're looking for that thoughtful process. So to keep moving along, the third stage, and all of these stages, by the way, sort of go in parallel. You yep. don't have to have each one complete, but you've got to have key parts uh, in, in, in each area. Um, is budget, finance plan, and schedule. Yep. And the reason I put all three together is you can't budget your film if you don't have a schedule. Yep. Uh, you know you're going to spend you're going to spend uh, three years in, in in the animation space. You're going to spend eighteen months. Um, are you going to be doing super high level uh, one artist one second a, a week, or are you going to be doing more like TV, which might be 10, 15 seconds a week. So without a schedule, you can't have a budget. And again, this shows to me whether the producer knows what they're talking about. Indeed. And then the finance plan is showing how you're raising the money to make the budget. Exactly. And I think Andrew spoke to this earlier. So the finance plan has to be in parallel with the budget. Because if I come up with a budget for 100 million and my finance plan is, say, European finance plan, of, uh, circa $15 million, yeah. Why have I got a Why have I got a, a schedule that intimates a hundred million? Um, and Chilo, so, I'm going to have to ask you to start wrapping up now because of the, right. the time. I, I, we, I, don't I, to, I, we don't I, want to hit two minutes silence at eleven o'clock. Great. So we have budget, finance, plan, schedule, all in parallel. Need to see them all. Then, um, then we need to know your co-producers and partners. I.e., is is what's the German studio going to be? Uh, how good can it be? And then finally, a final question to everyone is is What's the core audience of your film? Who are you making your film for? Yes. Um, yes. If you don't know your core audience and you don't know the types of people who want to go and see it, then the whole thing sort of uh, uh, falls to pieces. People often talk about four quadrants. For example, in the independent space, four quadrant doesn't really exist because none of us can afford to make a four quadrant film. But if you can get two quadrants or you can get one quadrant, cat lovers, for example, um, you're, you're, you're doing really well. And it again, again comes back to, are the producers realistic uh, in their ability to make this film? Brilliant, thank you so much, Sean. I'm gonna stop it there. And, and, and just a note to people sending questions in, some good questions coming in. If we don't get time to address them, we will get back to you and, and respond. Thank you, Helena, for example, who just sent us a question. Let, let's move on now to, to Britt, Britt Gardner. Hello, hello, Britt. Uh, for me, the art of filmmaking is making your budget look like you had at least twice as much, whether it's a $6 million movie or a $100 million movie. Britt is Chief Financial Officer of Locksmith Animation and is here to talk about the new movie and share her thoughts on growing a new studio. Here's a little clip from Ron's Gone Wrong. There's two kinds of people, Dad. The ones who have a bee bot and the ones who don't. What Dad, you got me one! I got what you need. Hi, Barney. I'm your best friend out of my box. Ready for the major Barney, your bee bot is like super weird. What are you doing? There's something wrong with it. Maybe turn it off and on again. <laughs> Making friends is what he's for. Friend request? Friend request. If he can't do that, he's pointless. Oh, Rose is pulling my head off. You can't pull his head off. OK, I cannot pull his head off. <laughs> I have no mega safety controls and stuff. Unlock. Unlock. Oh! Oh! I'd better look into that. You think? Find the road. <laughs> It's where I can see him. <laughs> Run's gone wrong. Rated PG. Now playing only in theaters. Brilliant. 
Uh, it looks lovely. Thank you so much, Britt. Um, can I, you can hear me, I hope, yes. yes. Um, Britt, thank you. Uh, talk to me a little bit about your role as Chief Financial Officer at Locksmith. Do you get involved in the budgeting of a film before it's greenlit? Oh, yes. I think it's absolutely critical. I mean, we are a small studio, but with big ambitions. But this is our first film. Uh, we started only seven years ago, and it's a theatrical release coming out of Fox. So when you have ambitions like that, finance is absolutely critical. I'm bound to say that, aren't I? Producers will say they're critical, directors critical. It's all part of the mix. Yeah. If you're going to be making high budget films, you need to know well in advance what you're doing. So I think the previous speakers have said how long it takes. So you don't just get involved at green light. You're in at the very start of when the ideas that are being pitched to put together into green light packages and you're starting to look at those costs and those types of films and how much you're willing to invest as a studio. And a bit like Sean, slightly different, what is the unmissable point of that film? Why would anybody want to invest in it, see it? And then how much are you willing to invest as a studio in that to get to a point where you can pitch it out? And, and tell, us, tell us about those investors, because presumably investors need looking after. They need to feel that their money's going uh, and being spent in the correct way. So will you just tell us something about how you manage that relationship and keep them on board during the, the de development and then the, the production of a movie? Yeah, I think it's critical, really, to find investors, if you can, that really have the same ambitions and, and also understand the time frame of animation. We've all talked about how long it takes. So I think it's very important that you find those investors and you find out what it is that they want. Some of it is just financial, of course, they want to get their money out, but some of it is because they want to be an EP on your projects, they like your creative talent. Some of it is because um, you might go into partnership with them. I mean, we, we did our first film with Double Negative and that was a great collaborative partnership for us. So, you need to always communicate with them and you need to keep them on board and constantly refresh your vision because it's an evolving marketplace. Look at what's happened in the last couple of years. Um, I mean, Phil's team at Jellyfish, they're working largely remotely. We did a lot of remote working. So finance is integral in keeping everybody aware of what the costs are, how they've changed and making sure your investors are aware of that and what they can expect. And, and when you're pitching to investors, are you pitching the studio or a particular film or do they like to see a slate? Oh, we've done all. <laughs> so we, we do it in, a, in quite a, a traditional way. Um, so we will tend to put together a formal investment memorandum, which will have lots of, we do lots of market research about where the market's going, uh, what we're likely, what type of projects are being commissioned, what type of budgets and how our projects might fit into that. And then we adapt ourselves for whether we're pitching for um, an investor for the company or an investor for the slate or for a specific film. And we are an independent studio, so we are looking to collaborate with many different partners. And so we're very open to that as well. I mean, my experience with investors is about a 10% hit rate. You have to sort of meet 100 in order to find 10 that are good. What's your hit rate like, Britt? Can you We've been extremely lucky. Um, <laughs> so we have been extremely lucky. We've got um, some very good investors and we've also got, um, we've got good relationships with the, the both the streamers and the uh, big US studios. And so for us, that's, that's been very important. And they have introduced us um, to external finance as well. And I think um, a, a lot of the other speakers were saying, particularly Sean just now, about how important it is that everybody trusts you. And that comes from the team that you put together, the directors, the producers, who you're using as your, your digital partner. We're a front end studio. Uh, obviously, we're always creeping a little bit forward on that tech stuff. But it, in essence, they want to know that that money's in a safe pair of hands when you're going for the sort of budgets that we're going for to make a film like Rob. And what do you mean by front-end studio? So we, we look after the whole of the project, but we do use a outsourced digital partner. Um, and the reason is because for a start, London is blessed with fantastic uh, studios that have, are encompassing VFX and animation. And um, we know that it requires a lot of technical development and our starting skill set is on the creative front end and putting the whole package together. So we are the producer of the whole film uh, as far as the studios and streamers are concerned. 
but we do involve a digital partner. And are you open and honest about that with your financiers and your... Oh, yeah, they, they know that that's our USP because if I'm honest, to invest in the type of thing that Jellyfish or Double Negative or any of them, Simset Micros, have done is a huge investment and different from what we're trying to do, which is bring the stories um, into the family audience. Yeah. So, so what's the secret for you of keeping an animated film on budget? Because it's quite easy for it to run away, isn't it? <laughs> Don't call it gone wrong. Don't yeah. do it in the middle of a <laughs> pandemic. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the thing is, you have to be flexible and you have to make compromise. Um, so we all know that the directors and creative producers will want to push everything to the nth degree. And there will come a point where you have to step in, the producers and the finance side, our production accountants step in and go, that just isn't going to be possible what's the most important thing about this film to you and so it's keeping that lines of communication open and being flexible things change you have to do your schedule your budget absolutely but you also have to know that you know the storyboard artist that you wanted isn't there they're doing something else so who else can you do so it is an element of flexibility and thinking fast on your feet feet to deliver yeah, and on that flexibility note, we've had a good question in from, I don't know whether it's Helena or Helena Mitchell, but forgive me if I've got that wrong. But Helena asks, when a show takes so long to get to the screen, how can you, how can you be sure that the market doesn't change too much in that time? Um, in seven years, your audience may change. Uh, technology will change. How do you adapt? Well, I think you always have in mind the overarching story and whether that's going to be pertinent for children. And children's lives don't, probably change that much yes the technology does so there is a risk and in our film there was a big risk I mean our film has bubble headquarters which is technologically advanced you just hope that you you've got it right and thought enough um, about it um, so that hopefully the surroundings of it don't don't put people off and the story still stands yeah, good. Thank you. And I'm going to take another question here from Jonathan. At what stage of a production uh, on a feature film should you be starting to pitch to investors? Well, we, we pitch at all different times, depending on our relationship with the investors and where we see the project going. So if we think that we've got something that we know somebody might like and want to be interested in, we'll pitch earlier on an outline or a treatment and with some art. Uh, but obviously, as I think uh, Sean said, when you go to the pictures, they really do want the script. Yeah, good, good, good. And, and, and just very finally, because we have to close for this silence. Yes. This question from Adrienne is just people are asking, just give us an indication of the budget of Ron's Gone Wrong. Just a ballpark figure, if you would. Look at illumination budgets and add some. <laughs> And, and add some. Okay, great. Thank you so much for, for that bit. That, that's excellent. Um, let's hand it back. There's the, the poppy. Um, we're going to have our silence now. Thank you, everybody, if you're still with us. And we really do appreciate um, carving out the time for that two minute silence. That was very important. Um, thank you for all of uh, to all of today's contributors to Sean, to Phil, to Britt and to Andrew. Um, and, and just a quick reminder that Sean, Andrew and I will be in wonder for further questions and chat in just a couple of minutes. So please do meet us there. If you have sent in questions, thank you for those. We'll make sure those are distributed accordingly. Jerry, that was a great, great question. So we'll make sure that's passed on. The next live session is at midday. Uh, Greenwich Mean Time, and that's your chance to hear from commissioners from the BBC and Warner Media, both organisations with new agendas around animation. Remember, you have to register for that if you haven't done so already, and then you'll get the Zoom link sent to you. Registration details are in the joining email that was sent to you. Don't miss that. But if you do, you can watch it tomorrow as a catch up video on our YouTube playlist. You were sent a link for that, and it's also posted in the chat now. Thank you again, everybody. Um, this is me, Robert Chandler, um, last surviving member of the Nostromo, signing off. And, um, and, and thank you for the session today. <laughs>